Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, I am uh, Huri Berbeyan, Professor of History, Merhuni Family Presidential Chair in Armenian Studies and Director of the Center for Armenian Studies. And on behalf of the Center for Armenian Studies and our co-sponsors, the UCI Department of History and UCI Global Middle East Studies, I would like to welcome you to this panel, Armenia's Velvet Voice and Vision in an Uncertain World. Uh, this panel is part of the Bahe and Armine Meruni lecture series, and we thank the Merunis as well as our donors and supporters here in Southern California and throughout the US and the world. Before we begin, an announcement about an upcoming event in April, the third part of our virtual salon, Armenian Communities in the Middle East. We'll explore the Armenian community in Turkey and will take place on April 23rd, Friday, at 12 o'clock Pacific time. We hope you will join us to hear our panelists discuss Turkey's Armenian community as we commemorate the 106th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. Thank you uh, to our panelists today uh, for sharing their time and expertise. Uh, and a special thanks to Anna Ohanian uh, for bringing them together and organizing uh, the panel today. So in 2018, uh, Armenia's decades long protest activity culminated in its Velvet Revolution, a democratic breakthrough in an authoritarian uh, neighborhood. This panel builds around, as you shall see, uh, the newly published Armenia's Velvet Revolution, Authoritarian Decline and Civil Resistance in a Multipolar World, World Order, uh, IB Taurus 2020, co-edited by Anna Ohanian and Lawrence Brewers, to explore the challenges and opportunities of Armenia's nascent democracy within a geopolitically reshuffled region and post-war reality. The panelists will argue for democratic consolidation as, a, uh, as essential for navigating a new uncertain world and delivering economic and security dividends for the Armenian state. The panel will also address the politics of Artsakh or nagorno karabakh the conditions of its, un of its unrecognized political status and post-war Russian patronage. Last but not least, the panel will bring in data from other recognized states around the world for a broader context and comparison. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to send in your questions. Uh, please make your questions clear and concise and on the themes explored by our panelists. Uh, if you use the raise hand function or try to send us a chat, it will not work. So we cannot see you, we cannot hear you, uh, you can only hear and see us. So please do use the Q&A function. So before, uh, before our panelists begin to speak, uh, I will introduce them, all four of them at once, and then uh, we will begin. Uh, thank you again very much for joining us. Our panelists uh, from all over the world, the United States, uh, Armenia, and Ireland uh, are the following. Anna Ohanian is a Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College, a two-time Fulbright Scholar to South Caucasus. She has published extensively and is the author and co-editor of four books, which include Networked Regionalism as Conflict Management, published by Stanford University Press in 2015, and the co-edited volume uh, we, I just spoke about, Armenia's Velvet Revolution. Professor Ohanian has served as a consultant for the US State Department, the National Intelligence Council Project, Maryland University, the United Nations Foundation, the World Bank, the Carter Center, and USAID. Her work has taken her across the globe from Northern Ireland to the Balkans, Russia, and the South Caucasus. Uh, Nerses Kopalian is, the, is an assistant professor in residence of political science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His fields of specialization include international relations, polarity, geopolitics, political theory, and philosophy of science. He is the author and co-editor of several books, including World Political Systems After Polarity, Rutledge 2017, and co-author of Sex, Power, and Politics, Palgrave Macmillan 2016. His current research concentrates on geopolitical configurations and greater power relations in Eurasia, as well as the role of democratic breakthroughs in authoritarian orbits and its implications on institutional reforms. He has authored several policy papers for the government of Armenia and is an advisor to the Office of High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, Office of the Prime Minister. He is currently coordinating a research project 
on institutional reforms and democratic consolidation. Kevork Oskanyan is an honorary research fellow at the University of Birmingham, UK. He obtained his PhD at the London School of Economics Department of International Relations and has previously taught at the LSE and at the University of Westminster. He is the author and editor of several monographs and volumes on the politics of Eurasia, including Russian Exceptionalism Between East and West, forthcoming with Palgrave in 2021, a monograph on the influence of imperial Tsarist and Soviet legacies on Moscow's contemporary worldview. His current research interests also include post-liberal approaches to international society and the state. Last but not least, Donika Obahain is professor of politics at the School of Law and Government, where he lectures on post-Soviet politics, unrecognized states, and Irish foreign policy. He has conducted research in all 15 former Soviet socialist republics and in the many unrecognized states that emerged after the USSR's collapse. He is principal investigator of Caspian, a 3.8 million euro 2020 project on the Caspian region. He is the author and editor of several volumes, including The Color Revolutions in the Former Soviet Republics, Successes and Failures, and From Partition to Brexit, the Irish Government and Northern Ireland, which is, which is the 2019 recipient of the Book of the Year Award from the Political Studies Association of Ireland. He is currently working on a book devoted to electoral politics in post-Soviet unrecognized states. Welcome to all of you. We will begin with Anna Ohanyan uh, and continue in the order in which I introduced uh, our expert panelists. Uh, they will each speak for about 15 minutes. I will remind them with hand gestures uh, if they are uh, over that uh, limit, and then we will open the floor up uh, for a discussion. Uh, Anna, please uh, lead us. Very good. Um, thank you very much, Udi, for hosting and sponsoring this panel, and to all of you who are joining, um, who are uh, joined in uh, uh, at this hour, and I'm really excited to have this really three accomplished researchers on this panel. Uh, it really is, this panel is built around the newly published book, uh, Armenia's Velvet Revolution. This is the second so-called book talk. The first one included some of the chapter authors, but with this panel, we thought to actually branch out and bring in much broader expertise uh, on democratization and security studies. And this is really a case that there is no shortage of, uh, uh, of really highly experienced uh, scholars to focus on Armenian context, to bring in the global social science um, on uh, to understand, to unpack how democratization and security intersect in more ways than one. So I'm really thankful um, to have this really accomplished panelists to join us. I will start with simply saying few words about the book, uh, primarily about my chapters in the book, but mostly will focus on the geopolitical dividends of democratic consolidation. The more commonly circulating uh, explanation that you hear in, uh, Ar in Armenian policy discourse in some corners is that Armenian uh, the Velvet Revolution did not have any geopolitical different, uh, the dividends because uh, Trump did not meet with Pashinyan and Europe did not send more money. Uh, so the picture is definitely a lot more complex. And uh, I'm really excited that we'll uh, tackle this theme of connections between democratic consolidation and security provision. Um, in terms of the uh, sort of the key takeaways of the Velvet Revolution, building on the chapters of the book. Uh, so we tried in this book to place the Velvet Revolution in a comparative context. How does it compare to similar transitions? And we argued that it is uh, Velvet Revolution was very different from uh, more geopoliticized color revolutions in the post-Soviet space. Uh, and then in contrast, um, we argued that the Velvet Revolution was a mass scale civic disobedience campaign unfolding within the broader parameters of Armenian statehood and constitutional order, a flawed but formal, um, I, I should highlight that. And because of these features, because the Velvet Revolution did not attack the state, even though again, that constitutional order was very, had all kinds of limitations, but because of the structures, we argue, uh, at least I did in my chapter, that Armenia's Velvet Revolution looks a lot, a lot more similar to Latin American transitions, democratic transitions in 1980s. 
Um, now, reflecting a little bit as to what's happening in on uh, next door Georgia, uh, it is clear that both Armenia and Georgia have arrived uh, are on, uh, are their democratic breakthroughs, democratic transitions through different pathways. But they now do face similar problems or democratic consolidations. To be more specific, managing political conflicts through institutions will test the durability of democratic openings in both cases. Also reflecting on summer events continuing, protests in Belarus, struggles with democratic consolidation in Ukraine, um, it really uh, uh, becomes clear that all new democracies, color or no color, are struggling in locking in democratic openings in the backdrop of institutional weakness of their states. Um, and the pathway we should keep in mind, this particular pathway of democratization, votes first, rights later, this is the mere opposite as to how older Western democracies have consolidated their democracies throughout centuries. So we need to be aware of this nuance as we look at the political protests on the ground, uh, both in Armenia as well as in Georgia. So to clarify very briefly, um, Western world of old and mature democracies built their states first and institutional rule of law first, uh, something political sciences, scientists described as constitutional liberalism after building sort of the scaffolding of uh, their state around the rule of law, they then proceeded to extend uh, the particip political participation through voting into the broader masses of their societies. So this rights first then votes is the pathway in Western democratic uh, states, but the newer democracies, younger democracies in the 20th, 21st century are moving in the opposite direction. Votes first, rights later, rights meaning institutions of statehood to maintain and protect the rule of law. Now, in, uh, is there an Armenian model? Uh, how does we, while Armenia faces some of these uh, vulnerabilities as some of the newer democracies, structurally it is, I argue, in the book, and in a much better place in managing this crisis institutionally. Um, and here in particular, uh, Armenia's, because Armenia's Velvet Revolution unfolded uh, without challenging the statehood, allowed Armenia to have this tactical stability in keeping the movement peaceful. But Armenia's democratic breakthrough was also taking place within a soft authoritarian system, uh, which is also can be described as a single party political system. As single party political soft authoritarian systems, they really manage their political system through mixture of coercion and consent. And the it was organized through single parties in Armenia, in this case, Republican Party, as well as, for example, Mexico, PRI, during much of the 20th century, they tend to be or have all kinds of cells and units within various sectors of the society. So the fusion uh, of society in the state, so the fusion of political party and the state apparatus created the relative stability um, and helped in uh, making the transition uh, uh, peaceful. However, uh, and this is really critical, this is something that is not in the book, um, the particular statehood uh, that existed against which the revolution was happening was one of technocratic state building with all of the liabilities that it has, as well as the levers for the government that it possessed. Um, what is happening after the, the Velvet Revolution is significant because it starts to, without challenging the state at the time, it is right now in the process of uh, political state building process, meaning that Armenia, Armenia's democratic breakthrough was a breakthrough, was a systemic uh, event rather than a regime change, right? And uh, one of the key and most important markers of that is that it kick-started state building as a political process, meaning that ballot box, the, ele the elections will start to work in tandem towards building better, more effective, more responsible uh, systems and structures of governance. 
Um, in contrast to uh, the, our, the, in the Armenian model, um, Ukraine and Georgia, in contrast to the Armenian model, Ukraine and Georgia experienced raptures. They were more top-down, geopoliticized, full confrontation with the state, and much fuller excision of the older guard. In this case, in the Armenian model, the grinding work of political state building is happening through the pallet box, through the protests, within the shadow um, of relative stability of the technocratic state. But again, uh, the, what I think in my early assessments is that what we're seeing in Armenia right now is the convergence of rights, of votes, and voice, um, uh, it, it, meaning that uh, people will have already have the skill, have the norms of nonviolence, and they will, they're better tracked, they're better positioned in uh, engaging in this political process of state building through elections. And studies do show that democratic breakthroughs that come through nonviolent civic disobedience campaigns, they're more likely to succeed and consolidate than other types of transitions. So this is a, an important finding within the social science literature to keep in mind. Now, in terms of the, uh, let me just jump over um, in terms of the geopolitical dividends, right? So uh, the again to clarify, geopolitical geopolitics, geopolitical dividends of the Velvet Revolution should not uh, should not be measured as to whether um, how much influence, how much attention, how much financial uh, leverage uh, came from the Western capitals or United States. Um, it, uh, uh, what I argue is that that conception of geopolitics is problematic. Um, in the 21st century, geopolitics is not a two-dimensional game uh, and involving narrow political elites with largely contained and managed great power competition that we saw during the Cold War. Um, the biggest geopolitical dividend of the Armenian Velvet Revolution is that it placed Armenia in the best path possible uh, in managing and navigating in this new geopolitics, which is multilateral with people power as an important source of leverage and legitimacy for the government. Even President Putin uh, realizes that in his statements, he always recognizes will have a mention of the Armenian people, right? So there's also seemed to be a tactical retreat from the Kremlin, but perhaps uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, so the, the, with this new geopolitics, multilayer, three-dimensional exercise, people power is central, the public legitimacy of the government is a crucial geopolitical resource um, because it can be used as a tool for hedging and balancing by the government. Um, it is playing, this new geopolitics is playing out in the backdrop of the rise of smaller states in the post-communist Eurasia, along with multiple powers contesting more spaces that were previously tucked on either side of the Iron Curtain. Thinking of geopolitical dividends of the Velvet Revolution in terms of alliance formation is limiting to say the least. Um, the key geopolitical outcome of the Velvet Revolution is that it put the state in the best possible pathway to engage in this multi-dimensional, three-dimensional new geopolitics. Now, um, in terms of alliances, if we are talking about alliances, um, central, they tend to produce cent uh, two-dimensional conception of geopolitics. And we have to be clear-eyed that alliances, there's a lot of data on this, that alliances can be destabilizing for various regions and not all alliances are created equal. Democratic alliances do have a better track record of durability. Um, and in short, autocrats are hard to trust. Um, Democratic alliances are also more institutionalized and rules bound. Now, clear eyed, being clear eyed about the nature and form of Armenia's alliance with Russia is essential. Um, assessing the geopolitical levers as well as liabilities that Armenia faces in its relationships with Russia. Uh, conceptualizing geopolitics as alliance formation, kind of with this, which, which is prevalent in the, the foreign policy establishment in Armenia, creates this very serious blind spot um, 
it uh, creates this notion that Russia is a bilateral player, but in reality, it is a systemic neo-imperial player. That is not to say that Armenia should not engage with Russia, absolutely not. A neo-imperial does not, I'm not using it in a negative connotation, simply to highlight that Russia is a systemic, uh, is an octopus, to put it simply, as opposed to a bear. Um, more public discourse on the nature of engagement with Russia is essential, one that needs to go beyond more Russia, more weapons rhetoric that dom tends to dominate the policy discourse in Armenia. Um, and again, the democratic consolidation and political state building path for Armenia is the key towards navigating Russia-Turkey rivalry, as well as Erdogan-Putin bromance, to put it simply. How much time do I have, Huri? I Why don't you take an extra couple of minutes since you- Very good, so. perfect. So I'll sum up. In terms of global geopolitics, Armenia may have fewer instruments to influence, but regionally it does have significant agency, significant power that it needs to deploy. Uh, in terms of regional, at the regional level, relationship between um, uh, relationship between democracy and security is fascinating and the social science scholars, quantitative studies are producing really important insights on this. Uh, the process of what we know is that the short term, in the short term, process of democratization may increase the risk of war and civil war in the short term. And it takes a long time, simply because it takes a long time for new institutions to mature domestically to accommodate deep social conflicts. But again, because because of the velvet signature in Armenian case, Armenia, I do think, is managing this quite well. At the systemic regional level, um, and I'm quoting from Hegre, a world with an intermediate share of democracy might be associated with more war, since the probability of war, on average, is highest in dyads with one democracy and one non-democracy. What this means is that, to simplify, more stronger, deeper uh, democra democratic in South Caucasus is the best uh, path forward towards security provision. So what happens in Georgia matters for Armenia because democracies regionally, when they, they do support one another, and when they do when they do that, they do create pressures for a better security. And we can talk about how to think about uh, the remaining authoritarian systems, in this case, Azerbaijan, and then the broader geopolitical authoritarian neighborhood with Turkey and Russia. But essentially, uh, the increase in the proportion of democracies in a region tends to pacify that region, creating stronger pressures for democratization on all countries. Um, and the, the, the Latin America is cited frequently simply because um, the territorial claims there were addressed, started to be addressed peacefully after the continent went through uh, uh, went through a period of the democratization. Let me conclude with, I'm not going to drag you into the democratic peace theory debate. Uh, my fellow political scientists are uh, probably uh, uh, very, very familiar with it, but simply to say that there is a correlation between peace, trade, investment, growth, and democracy and democratization. Um, and the agreement is very specific in this respect, at least on paper, I don't want to, I haven't been on the field, I have not done any interviews, but the reason I've been writing about this at Carnegie, there is an opportunity for openness of the borders, depending how they will be managed, to create the political space for deepening democracy and creating the economic dividends for it to stick. So I will stop here and, uh, uh, and to transfer this to Nerses, right? Yes, thank you, Anna. Nerses? Uh, thank you very much for hosting this. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take on a third level uh, analytical imagery and kind of reduce it to the second level, and I'll be covering the uh, domestic uh, developments in Armenia and uh, sort of gauge the uh, democratization process and concerns of stability that we have seen after the 2020 uh, Arsak war. Um, we saw that the post-war crisis in Armenia's domestic political theater after the uh, trilateral uh, ceasefire did produce a wide range of conceptual concerns about the viability of democratic gains obtained after the Velvet Revolution. 
And so there was a broader narrative seeking to qualify the discourse into this sort of rigid dichotomy, uh, security and stability versus democracy and state failure. Uh, I argue that the attempt to construct such a dichotomy has primarily failed, and the discourse on a political level in Armenia remains not so much a crisis that has engulfed Armenian society, but rather a crisis within the political elites. So we saw that upon the signing of the ceasefire agreement, temporarily, we did see violent protests break out. What was initially perceived as a sort of the organic, visceral reaction to the trauma of military defeat was soon revealed to be something else. Initial assessments that the fallout from the ceasefire would lead to intense public anger, uh, mass political mobilization, and sort of being the nascent stages of large anti-government protests actually proved to be incorrect. Rather, after each passing day, it became more evident that the assumed political crisis operated primarily within an echo chamber that was constructed by the authoritarian regime, excuse me, the authoritarian reserves that are primarily composed of uh, operatives of the pre-Velvet regime, of the previous regime. So in this context, the uh, trauma of military defeat did not produce the sufficient political fallout anticipated by the anti-government or the anti-democratic forces. Uh, at the same time, the endeavors of the opposition coalition, which have been dubbed as sort of this group of 17, uh, did fail to construct a message that resonated with Armenian society. The outcome then has been primarily a lot of noise, but not much substance. And it is within this echo chamber that the opposition has primarily operated in struggling to expand its political audience. And so the flailing opposition, which to a large extent was on the verge of collapse, did receive some last minute oxygen in the last two weeks when the military brass interjected itself into the political realm and sort of demanded the resignation of Prime Minister Pashinyan. Now, while this temporarily reinvigorated the opposition, it has still failed to translate into substantive political gain. Further, the institutional mechanisms which allow for the procedural solution to the push and pull between the executive and the army general staff delimited the attempt to drag this inter-institutional problem into street politics. So collectively, the perceptions of domestic instability or assessments of a political crisis that is you know, at the precipice of instigating a civil conflict appear at the stage to be exaggerations of a loud political elite that function within a narrow echo chamber. In this contextually speaking, this has not resonated to broader Armenian society. Now, you know, the inability of, of the opposition in the face of military and territorial losses that the government has sustained, so the inability of the opposition to conjure up a sizable movement against the Velvet government is highly indicative of five important factors that need to be uh, addressed. Uh, the first is that Armenia's domestic political theater is far more stable than meets the eye. Second, the opposition, as far as the Armenian electorate is concerned, lacks for trust, trust and credibility. And this has resulted in the failure of the anti-democratic opposition to construct a tenable movement. Uh, third, I will note that the Velvet government has immensely benefited from this lack of credibility that the opposition suffer, suffers from, and the government has further benefited from the lack of an alternative, which has allowed the current government to sustain the political shock of the war. But just as important, the fourth point uh, I want to notice that the Velvet government's electoral base has remarkably sustained itself. And Prime Minister Pashinyan's support among his base, which is primarily rural, and middle class and lower middle class, with very high numbers of female supporters, remains quite strong. And the fifth point that I want to mention is that the Velvet government's political coalition has also proven to be remarkably stable. We have seen minuscule or very limited defections from the thing, My Step Coalition, which speaks extensively to this sort of sustainability. Now, you know, what explains these developments? Uh, what accounts for the fact that the government, under whose leadership uh, the ultimate political sin in Armenia's political culture was committed, the loss of territories, has been able to absorb these shocks? Okay? So in essence, uh, how are we to understand the trending power configurations in Armenia's domestic politics? Um, and I've kind of looked at the survey data, I've looked at the empirical patterns, and 
I kind of observed four uh, causal explanations that uh, address these developments. The first causal explanation is that the government enjoys high levels of institutional and, institu and interpersonal trust. And there's a large body of evidence that kind of supports the uh, discourse that you know, governments that enjoy institutional trust tend to be very, very consistent and sustainable, and they prove very, very conducive to democratic consolidation. So when we look at the survey data and we see the extensive levels of institutional trust that the current government enjoys, this is actually a rarity in our means 30 years of independence. Um, just to kind of draw a very quick uh, comparison, if we lag the data back to 2018 and we come all the way uh, right before the war to 2020, we see consistently high levels of citizen trust towards the current government. And then even after the losses of the 2020 war, uh, we saw the IRA survey, which came out approximately a day or two ago, thus continue to show fascinating levels of citizen support and trust in state institutions, even after a sort of a catastrophic thing outcome uh, that the war produced. Uh, some quick numbers that are necessary, important to think, point out that demonstrate institutional trust citizens have. Um, the armed forces, even after the, the, the military losses, we see 73% favorable ratings by the public. This has shown so about a 12 to 50% drop prior to the war, but a 70 percentile is still very, very robust. Um, we saw 60%, uh, for example, of favorability rating towards the police. This is a traditionally hated institution. So the fact that the current government succeeded in the last two to three years to undertake some form of some level of reforms and thus develop public trust in an institution that has been traditionally hated is an important indicator. Uh, the RI survey also was very interesting in uh, showing the support, the 54% support that we saw towards the office of the prime minister. Uh, this is about a 20% uh, drop from what the prime minister had prior to the war, but he still remains quite popular. Uh, and this does suggest that citizens, although perhaps very disappointed in the outcome of the war or the performance of the office of the prime minister, nonetheless, there is still trust in that institution. So all of these have kind of been crucial in explaining um, why this government has been able to sustain itself even after the losses. And uh, just another quick point, the survey showed that 62% of the population trusts the current government to oversee potential snap elections. That's a very, very important uh, thing, a vote of confidence. However, when uh, asked about the opposition demands for a transitional government, there was only 21% support. So collectively, there appears to be a robust trust towards the post-development institutions that are in its developmental stages. So uh, yes, yeah, so, so I was talking about the second cause of explanation, which was the absence of an organic or legitimate opposition. Um, and so a few points that the survey data shows, uh, the largest parliamentary opposition party, Prosperous Armenia, they're only stuck at 3% insufficient to pass the 5% threshold of re-entering parliament. Um, if the former president, Robert Kocharyan, who's been sort of, you know, viewed as the primary financier and supporter of the anti-democratic forces, if he, he was to put together a coalition to participate in snap elections, his support also only stands at 3%. Uh, the former ruling Republican Party, they perform even worse. They stand at 1%. Same with the ARF Dostok Tsitsun at 1%. And surprisingly, Bright Armenia, which is the only democratic opposition and one that is not aligned with the group of 17, they also perform abysmally at 1%. So I'm kind of throwing out you know, the, these numbers in a rapid fire fashion, but collectively, what we're seeing is that the electoral field looks exceedingly difficult for the entire opposition. And this has translated to the current government being able to sustain its electoral base in the face of political crises. Um, the third causal explanation is the immense reserves of political capital in Prime Minister Pashinyan's toolkit. This hasn't been addressed uh, sufficiently, but he does have extensive uh, political reserves. Um, whereas we see the opposition parties being in a three percentile and one percentile range, Pashinyan's civic contract garners 33% electoral support according to the recent data.
And as I noted with the Office of the Prime Minister, sitting at 54%. So these are robust numbers in relation to a opposition that is inherently struggling. Um, now, the important factor to consider, however, is that because Armenia's politics is much more personalistic than institutional, we see that the relative high approval of the office of the prime minister or the so-called defeated prime minister is highly indicative of his immense uh, political capital. And so in the same context, when we observe the data, uh, we see that those, those uh, forces that have become political challengers or opponents of the prime minister have actually seen an exponential drop in support. And I, you know, the data just basically brought up two very important examples I want to point out. Uh, let's look at the office of president. Um, you know, uh, Armin Sarkisian enjoyed approval ratings surpassing the 80 percentile pr prior to this whole critical crisis. His support has dropped to 33 percent. This is a shocking change in public approval for Armin Sarkisian. And this, of course, is primarily due to the general perception that Sarkisian has been giving undue oxygen to the non-democratic opposition. Whether that's true or not is besides the point. That remains the public perception. Uh, and of course, uh, the same thing that we've seen uh, with the Bright Armenia Party, a party that was viewed as a constructive opposition, a democratic opposition, which had support in the six to seven percent range, has really dropped to the one percentile range because they're also viewed as being problematic in their opposition to the velvet values. So these are sort of important things to uh, observe. But collectively, Pashinyan's political capital has translated into two developments. The formation of a robust electoral base that remains highly loyal to him, and the deterioration of supporters of those who are viewed as being skewed towards the anti-democratic opposition. And then I'll think our fourth causal explanation, which is Anna kind of touched up on this, which is the legacy of democratic politics. That is the electoral legitimacy of the current government. Uh, the survey data is very clear on this. There's a very large disparity between public support for the Pashinyan government and the opposition. And the disparity holds constant for both types of oppositions, whether it's the authoritarian reserves or the more constructive democratic opposition. Uh, we see that citizen trust of Pashinyan and institutional support of his government translates into citizen distrust towards the opposition. So there is a negative correlation. In this context, the credibility of opposition forces increases when they align with the government and decreases when they oppose the government. For this reason, regardless of the opposition's ideological leanings, public support is heavily tied to support of the velvet government. Now, undoubtedly, this to a very large extent is directly tied to the legacy of the Velvet Revolution. You know, the fight against corruption, abuse of power, persecution, all the horrors that Armenian society suffered for the last 30 years are equated with the Velvet Revolution as being the remedy. For this reason, Armenia's democratic culture is also directly tied to the Velvet Revolution. And since the Pashian government represents the culmination or the realization of the Velvet Revolution, the legacy has remained persistent in limiting the capabilities of the opposition even after the post uh, ceasefire crisis. And so, kind of to quickly wrap up uh, my, my talk here, the crisis was presumed to become a lot more complex and problematic um, with the recent uh, clash between the, the army chief of staff or the general staff and uh, the, the office of the prime minister uh, over the, the demand of the prime minister's resignation. And this created this whole uh, discourse, is there a coup or, or, or a possible attempted coup? Are we seeing the military interject into politics? Is the crisis being heightened? Uh, that does not seem to be the case. Uh, I've argued before, um, Anna, we worked on this with Anna, Army's military is a lot more institutionalized than people think. And the general staff did not view its behavior as being one of infringing into politics, but rather they are viewing themselves as attempting to counterbalance what they perceive to be brash behavior by a highly politicized prime minister. Uh, whether that's acceptable or not is a whole different uh, subject of discussion, but a very important point to, to present here. This problem or this issue is being resolved through constitutional and institutional mechanisms. Uh, the uh, chief of staff or perhaps former chief of staff is still unclear what Onik Hazan's position, Gassman's position is, but um, fundamentally, he has taken the case to the constitutional court. 
So we are seeing for the first time that I can recall constitutional mechanisms being utilized to resolve issues that could potentially have severe implications. And so this push and pull within interinstitutional issues is a very important indicator of Armenia's growing or burgeoning a democratic culture, that problems are being resolved institutionally and not behind the scenes or under the table, which has been traditionally the norm. So I am just going to wrap up here and kind of uh, note that uh, while we, there does seem to be a general perception of political instability, uh, I've qualified this as being more of a discourse and conflict within the political elites and not something that has destabilized the public sphere or the broader political landscape. Thank you, Nessus. Kevork? Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I must congratulate the, uh, the authors of the book, the co-authors of the book for the, uh, for the excellent volume. Uh, while I was reading it recently, I, I read it and I tried to tie it to the contemporary situation Armenia finds itself in. Um, and more specifically, the, the sense of crisis, uh, the sense of uh, hopelessness that exists uh, in, in Armenia at this moment, and specifically the choices that have to be made regarding the uh, regarding poli uh, Armenia's political system going forward. Uh, and in that sense, I find it quite um, quite concerning that a kind of dichotomy has emerged, uh, especially between the, the opposition on the streets and uh, uh, and the proponents of Pashinyan uh, between the idea of democracy as weak as entailing a kind of uh, complacent attitude towards security versus the need for, for a strong garrison state that would be, uh, you know, that would be able to solve these, uh, uh, the problems Armenia is facing, the security problems Armenia is facing in a more authoritarian manner. Uh, and one of, one of the things that I want to do in this talk is really advocate for democracy, but for a rather more realist perspective than what, what, Anna, what Anna has done. So I will question some of the assumptions that, liberal assumptions that are made when it comes to democracy and, and foreign policy and ge geopolitics. And now I'm going to argue for democracy and I'm going to avoid three fallacies that I find um, are not relevant to the Armenian case. And the first I would call the sympathy fallacy, the idea that Armenia should democratize because it would somehow, because it would somehow elicit uh, sympathy from the West, from Western states. And you could actually see that as the conflict was raging. Uh, there was a lot of frustration on social media and in the Armenian media about the fact that, you know, Armenia has democratized, Karabakh has democratized, Artsakh has democratized. Well, why is the West not helping us to a greater extent? And it's actually a fallacy that you find more often in the former Soviet space. And I, I, I wrote a, a foreign policy article on this. Um, regarding, for instance, Saakashvili's expectations of aid uh, from the West because of his Georgia's democratic status, its status as kind of a pet project of the George W. Bush administration at the time. But even then, you know, when Georgia, uh, with its status as a pet, pet project, when things got uh, out of hand with, with Russia, couldn't count on direct Western aid. So I think the first sympathy that, the first uh, fallacy that Armin should, should avoid is this sympathy fallacy. It will earn us brownie points in the West. This is why we should democratize. The second fallacy I find is the peace fallacy. Um, I'm going to diverge a bit from what Anna said about um, the pacifying effects of, um, of democratization in, in the Caucasus specifically. Yes, I know about the, uh, the quantitative work that is being done and that suggests that the emergence of democracy in, in a region leads to greater democratization. But uh, what I find, and it's something that I argued as well when uh, right after the Velvet Revolution, uh, when there were also quite a few noises coming out saying that, well, Armenia is democratizing. There was this sense of optimism regarding the, uh, the Karabakh problem, that there would be progress now towards peace. Um, on that, I would have to point out that the main dyad, so to speak, within the Caucasus is the, and regarding Armenia specifically, is, is the one with Azerbaijan. And that's a democratic authoritarian dyad, which we know, which we know from, from much of the um, literature is quite unstable. Uh, so I would, you know, the, the idea that, uh, that Armenia democratizing would somehow, even with 
the addition of an imperfectly democratic Georgia that that would lead to to more uh, to peace is I think a fallacy again that uh, Armenians should should avoid they should uh, they should not assume that they should not take on these liberal assumptions going forward and the third fallacy I think is is quite obvious it's a personal fallacy the idea that Armenia should democratize that uh, that then uh, which then mixes with the personalized politics in Armenia and then you know ends up essentially uh, in into uh, in advocacy for Pashinyan, which is also something that I would uh, that I would avoid. Now the argument that I'm going to make is that Armenia should democratize because democracy is simply the, the best road towards security, towards its ability to provide for security for its own population, for its own territory. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to look at security not in terms in military terms, in very narrow sense of terms, but you have to look at security comprehensively and uh, interactively. So the comprehensive idea of security, you have to have a holistic view of security that incorporates various issue areas, military, but also economic, and importantly, also human. Uh, this is the comprehensive view of security that the OSCE pushes as quite uh, essential in looking at the security enhancing properties of democracy itself. And the other uh, important thing to keep in mind is the, is the idea that, of course, security is interactive, it's intersubjective, no state is an island, figuratively speaking, okay, Britain is an island, but we're speaking figuratively. Um, it interacts and it's the, the, the decisions it makes ultimately, uh, ultimately lead to reactions from its uh, neighbors and its adversaries. So taking these two um, conceptualizations of security forward, I argue that democracy is the best way for uh, Armenia to secure itself. Uh, so let's look at the, at the idea of comprehensive security. I, I would argue that a long-term comprehensive view of security actually makes democracy essential and makes avoiding the strongman fallacy, the idea that you take a, a, a tough talking individual like Kocharyan, go back to the go back to the future, so to speak, and trust his methods to his his um, his more assertive methods to you know, to lead to uh, a solution to the Artsakh problem uh, that that should be avoided. And the first point I would like to make based on the literature out there all, on, on large body of literature is that Firstly, democracies are simply better at fighting wars. Uh, there's quite a lot of quantitative literature that argues precisely that. Um, very interestingly, at the beginning of the, of the previous decade, there was actually there were actually a few scholars who started using um, mathematical models, used the correlates of war project, fed them into the models, and ended up over time with systems that were completely democratic because democracies are so are statistically so so good at fighting wars and there are all kinds of reasons why that makes sense and uh, why that makes sense first of all accountable government um the fact that democracy provides transparency uh means provide uh, democracy provides transparency firstly through the uh, presence of an opposition uh, the fact that you have a government that you have an opposition looking over the shoulders of the government questioning all uh, questioning the government all the time that makes a huge a huge difference um, it's, it's a very important difference and it's one that in armenia unfortunately is not has not yet been um, been accomplished and one of the weaknesses in armenia's democratic in, in armenia's democratic trajectory over the past few years has precisely been the absence of an opposition of a healthy opposition within parliament um, it's, I believe that over the, over the, over the longer term, it uh, impedes the emergence of a political culture that will be able to maximize the, uh, the kind of supervisory functions, function that ultimately an opposition would have to perform. And that is now very much, that is now very, mu very much lacking. Uh, but the fact that we need, uh, we need such a function actually in, uh, increases the, uh, the need for democratization. And then of course, uh, oversight more, more generally, uh, the fact that a liberal democratic system would enable, for instance, a commission of inquiry, uh, an independent commission of inquiry into what went wrong um, during 
September, October, November during the past war. What you now have is essentially different parts of the elite and counter elites accusing each other, uh, a rift between the civilian and military branches, branches of gov government, precisely based partly on, bl on blame for the war that might never be resolved and that might never be illuminated if Armenia departs from, from its, from its dem democratic path. So this, this um, commission, a political culture that enables these kinds of commissions, that enables the kind of, um, uh, the kind of transparency that, uh, that would address these issues is absolutely necessary. Then of course, the fact that democracies are better at, uh, at resource allocation because of the rule of law, uh, their uh, ability to combat corruption. And in Armenia's case, of course, you know, it's been very clear uh, that um, that has actually been, been a major issue uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the armed forces over the past 20, 20, 30 years. Everyone, I believe, remembers the treasure trove of General Manvel that was brought up right uh, a few months after the Velvet Revolution. Now, every single item there, of course, has uh, is is one item less that was available to the to the uh, uh, to the armed forces. So efficiencies through the rule of law, accountability through the rule of law becomes uh, becomes quite uh, uh, quite essential. And then finally, also tapping into the comprehensive view of security. It's the ability of democracy to provide for economic and especially human security. Uh, and as we all know, one of the great um, challenges for Armenia over the past 20 years has been demographic crisis. Uh, and dem democratic re retreat over the, over the next few years would, would simply, you know, a reversal to a, reversal to a semi-authoritarian or an authoritarian system where you have a state that essentially is more of a threat to society that it's that citizens do not identify with. That is another uh, way in which the uh, the efficiencies of the of the of the, uh, uh, of the Armenian state would be affected. So overall, if you take the comprehensive view of security, democracy as a system over the longer term actually becomes quite essential uh, to Armenia's ability to secure itself. Uh, but that has that in itself is not enough. Uh, you need to combine that democratization with a prudent foreign policy. Um, and in that sense, actually, I believe that the Velvet Revolution had this kind of prudence, um, uh, prudence inserted into it from the very beginning. It's a, it's unwillingness to in, to become geopolitical, to turn into a color revolution. Um, was very important in that regard. And going forward, that kind of prudence should be, uh, should be built upon. And it implies a foreign policy that neither engages in naivety nor um, uh, allows itself uh, aggression. So it's a balance between complacency and revanchism. Machiavelli referred to it as uh, the lion and the fox. Uh, a good prince has to know his limits and his possibilities has to act as a fox, as a wily fox, whenever he or he is uh, he's weak, and go for uh, and use his full capabilities going forward. And such a balanced foreign policy, on the one hand, means that a democratic Armenia, go, uh, a democratic Armenia, would have to be would not should not allow itself to become defense. Uh, uh, complacent when it comes to military reform going forward. So all the advantages that I've given in the previous uh, in the previous few minutes that democracy would bring to Armenia should be should be employed to uh, to enhance a defensive form of uh, a defensive military reform um, based on you know, the can, the kind of efficiencies that you would gain from from democracy. So that's one side. But on the other hand, of course, Armenia should avoid engaging in the kind of revanchism, trying to go back to the um, to the status quo ante, so to speak, that existed before September September 20, 2019. And the reasons for that are multiple. I mean, if you look at, for instance, um, look at the map. Very simple. The strategic situation around Artsakh is uh, is uh, is untenable. Uh, the balance of power goes, is going completely against, uh, is completely arraigned against uh, against Armenia. 
Uh, and most, most importantly, I think Armenians have to understand that Artsakh is no longer under, uh, under Armenian protection, it is under Russian protection. And the Russians are there not as allies, but as peacekeepers. Um, so any kind of you know, revanchist dreams that would exist out there in, in, in Armenian society would have very much to be dropped. That does not mean, on the other hand, that Armenia should remain uh, passive. Uh, it should press for the rights of the Armenians and for the physical security of Armenians, but knowing that if previously most roads went through Moscow, now all of them, or almost all of them, uh, um, lead through Moscow. So the idea that, you know, that, that um, uh, Arme uh, Armenia's agency might be very circumscribed, but uh, it would still have to maximize it by especially influencing Moscow. And that is the only, that is basically the main way they would be able, they would be able to do that. Uh, and luckily enough, I believe that the Russians do have an interest in securing Artsakh um, for their own geopolit geopolitical uh, geopolitical reasons. So there is there's much to play play on uh, play on there. Uh, and in combination with that, I also believe Armenia should go for normalization uh, with its neighbors. Uh, and normalization is often a loaded word in the uh, in the context of Armenian politics, partly also because it, it's often confounded with reconciliation. Um, so normalization to me would mean to have a um, to have embassies in each other's capitals and uh, to and to allow for some form of uh, cross border interaction between Armenia and Azerbaijan and Armenia and Turkey. Now, while that is very difficult to envisage at this point, partly because of um, Azerbaijan's gaslighting, um, you know. Azerbaijan, the signals coming out of Azerbaijan at this point are extremely uh, um, contradictory. On the one hand, they're talking about regional integration and cooperation. On the other hand, it's about, uh, they call Armenia a fascist state that doesn't deserve an army. Um, they talk about, uh, of course, if you have the, you have the hostages in, in Baku, uh, claims on Gezur and all that. But beyond that, I believe Armenia should be open to normalization, uh, not reconciliation. And there are two reasons for that. Firstly, because um, those borders are going to open anyway. It's very clear that Russia has invested a lot of social capital in the idea of reintegrating the South Caucasus over the past few months. So I believe that you know, the, at some point there will be cross-border interaction and uh, flows of uh, uh, goods, and, uh, goods and people. Uh, and on the other hand, um, at that point, you have to ask yourself, well, is it better for Armenia to uh, to always to communicate with its adversaries through third parties, or is it better to simply, uh, or, uh, or is it better to have direct communications, given the fact that you know, these kinds of movements are going to happen anyway? So, the, the, in it, to wrap up, um, the pressures that I, the realities that I've enumerated are realities, structural realities that every, any government would have to be, would have to confront. And at that point, you have to ask yourself, um, what form of government, which system would better address all these challenges? And the answer is without a doubt, a democratic system uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gebrok. Last but not least, Donaka. Oh, hello, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, excellent panel, and congratulations to, to Anna again on her uh, really timely and seminal work. It's, it's a wonderful piece uh, that she's put together with, uh, with Lawrence Flores, and I just uh, share my screen if I may. I'm unique here, it seems, in, in wanting to, to share my screen, and uh, I'll just bring up some slides that I had prepared. Actually, one thing that we have in common uh, in terms of authors, is that when I produced a book some time ago on the color revolutions, which was mentioned uh, in the intro, um, the the contributor to the Armenia chapter was Mika Zolian, who also, of course, contributes a chapter to 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 uh, Anna's book uh, as well. And of course, uh, Mika has gone on now to to be a member of the uh, the Armenian Parliament uh, since then. And as was said as well, I, I have been doing research for some time 
on the phenomenon of uh, domestic politics in unrecognized states and and um, particularly elections. Um, I, I have observed elections going back now well over a dozen years in, in Abkhazia, in Transnistria, in, um, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, I, I do that because um, it's, it's considered to be somewhat of an academic curiosity, the whole phenomenon of unrecognized states. But I think my pitch will be to kind of be in harmony with the other speakers about democracy is that democracy tends to be seen as the preserve of, of, of recognized states. Um, and, and these unrecognized states, I think because they're considered to be transient phenomena, um, they're, they're not given the same degree of scrutiny or, or they don't excite the same curiosity to try and evaluate what kind of governance do they have? Do they reflect the will of the people? Are, they, are the elections free and fair? To what extent do they, are, are elections mechanisms by which the people choose their governors? Uh, those questions don't tend to be asked. Uh, they, they're generally presented as pawns in geopolitical games. They, they lack agency. And, and therefore, I, I have steered clear, or tried to steer clear, it's, it's difficult, of course, of the great geopolitical debates, and tried to look at them on their own terms, as simple as polities, as, 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 as communities, as societies, as small societies. This is one thing that they all have in common, at least the, the post-Soviet quartet, which I've been looking at. Um, just to give a brief overview, to, to state the obvious, perhaps, that the world map is, is deceptively complete, uh, complete, that every, when you look at the globe, of course, every, every inch, every centimeter has a color apportioned to it, but that does not necessarily reflect the reality, and these unrecognized states disrupt that picture of, of outward stability, and, and um, indeed, they, they have existed now for almost three decades, uh, the ones that I have been looking at in the post-Soviet space. So I think that we can perhaps look at them as, as at least, if not permanent features of the international landscape, as ones that are not as transient as perhaps uh, ones like Biafra uh, and Katanga, where, for example, in the 1960s in Africa, or Chechnya uh, in, in, uh, in Russia in the 1990s. I'm just having a problem moving along the slide there. And uh, so not all unrecognized states are the same. Uh, that's an important thing to say. Um, there are different degrees of being recognized or unrecognized. Uh, one of them is, for example, having no recognition at all. Um, and a state like Somaliland, for example, uh, up until uh, last year, was not recognized by a single state, be it unrecognized or recognized, in the world. And that has changed as of last year when Taiwan opened diplomatic relations with Somaliland. And that, that indicates itself a phenomenon uh, in this uh, sphere that unrecognized states have a vested interest in establishing relations with other unrecognized states. And that's a whole area of interest, and I think a fascinating one, of how there is this kind of parallel diplomacy uh, between those states that are unrecognized or partially recognized. Uh, then you have those non-UN member states which are recognized only by other non-UN member states, and they include uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and Transnistria, and now Somaliland having established relations with Taiwan. You have those that have uh, been recognized by at least one UN member state, but not many more, uh, less than 10. And they would include Abkhazia and South Ossetia, who have five recognitions each, and uh, Northern Cyprus, which is recognized only by its patron, Turkey. Um, and of course, many of you will be familiar that there's a certain dichotomy in Turkey's attitude about unrecognized states, being a patron of one and, of course, being a, an opponent of another Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, but that's not unusual. Um, and, um, and then you have those that have achieved widespread recognition but are still not recognized as, as, as an integral part of the international community. Uh, they have more than 10 UN member states who recognize them. Kosovo, for example, which has about 100 recognitions. Taiwan, which is now down to about 14. It's been whittled away by China year on year. Um, Palestine, which is the, the most, over 130. And, and Western Sahara, which again has varied over the years now at about 40-something uh, recognitions. And of course, they're not all the same in terms of... Uh, territory or population, there's huge diversity. And this is one of the things I'd like to stress as well, is that there, you, you get the, the question sometimes about, general questions about unrecognized states as if they're all the same. And comparing, you know, unrecognized states, are, saying that they're all the same is a little bit like suggesting that Sweden and Somalia are very similar because they're both recognized. Uh, there are this huge diversity uh, amongst unrecognized states. If you look there, for example, a state like Taiwan with 23 million people, uh, you have that kind of a state, and you have South Ossetia with 35,000 people. 
Uh, and similarly, in terms of size, you have Somaliland, which is huge, 134,000 square kilometers, and, and you have somewhere like Northern Cyprus with, with 3,400. So there's a huge diversity out there as well. There are historical cases, uh, Ireland indeed, from where uh, I'm speaking now, and indeed you probably can hear the, the pitter-patter of the rain uh, on the roof. Um, that was, you might say, a, a putative um, state uh, in the early 20th century, when like Armenia actually was knocking on the door of the Paris Peace Conference as the empires were collapsing and looking for independence. And Armenia, of course, briefly got its, its moment in the sun. Uh, Ireland didn't, because, of course, Ireland was part of a victorious empire, uh, whereas uh, Armenia was escaping from a defeated empire. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting that we did have that brief period of sending emissaries around the world when we weren't recognized. And, of course, like many recognized states, Ireland forgot about that history once it became recognized. That's a very common feature of the evolution of states as well. The others are far less savory, perhaps, in their trajectories. They all disappeared after a few years. And I think that's very much influenced the lack of detailed scrutiny that we give, uh, that we afford to uh, unrecognized states, that we, we have this notion at the back of our mind that they're not going to be around for long. And as I said, after three decades, I think we can maybe disabuse ourselves of that notion and maybe afford them uh, at least the academic recognition that they perhaps deserve at this stage. There's not even a consensus about what to call these states, and I've just collected a, a few uh, out there. Everything from unrecognized states, which is the, which is the term that I like the most. Um, de facto states is, is kind of the main competitor uh, because they exist de facto. But actually, it was at a conference by Lake Savan uh, several years ago when uh, an advisor to the uh, Artsakh prime minister pointed out that de facto states wasn't really a good term, he says, because all, it's, all states, he said, whether they're recognized or not exist de facto. Um, it's not really a great description. Whereas unrecognized, you know, emphasizes the lack of recognition, which is the is the key component here. So ever since then, actually, it was kind of a, a, a moment for me. I said, okay, I'm never using de facto states really in my literature, in my work again. I'm, I'm going to stick with unrecognized states. But there's a lot more out there, as you can see, shadow states, states within states, phantom states, separatist states, informal states. And you get various, as, as you go down the list, you see more... Um, uh, oppositional terms that are used, puppet regime, uh, puppet state, um, uh, occupied territory, of course, uh, one that's used as well. Um, and of course, there's no consensus about the terminology that people should use, the place names, whether the state from which they've seceded is a parent state, which is insulting to some, or is it a Bay state? Um, is, uh, do, do you have refugees that have left these areas or IDPs? Are we dealing with international borders or administrative boundary lines? Uh, and, and, and again, what's even the term of reference here? Is this a matter of, of, of territorial integrity or self-determination or, or occupied territories? Are these frozen conflicts or are they protracted conflicts? Some people are, get very animated when you use the term frozen conflicts. They say that these things, as has been illustrated, of course, in the case of Karabakh, uh, were perhaps better called simmering conflicts rather than frozen ones. Um, and again, why so little attention? Because they have been viewed, at least initially, as a phenomenon. Um, and uh, they, there is the parent state narrative or base state narrative that these are puppet regimes with no autonomous dynamic or agency of their own. And this has sometimes been implicitly accepted by many observers. Uh, they're often perceived as places that are just simply difficult to get to and dangerous, um, informational black holes, as they were called by Charles King 20 years ago. And, um, but there is a persistence, as I said, of de facto states now. And finally, we're, we're seeing a growing literature. Uh, looking at, at, at de facto states, looking at unrecognized states, even if, as I said, the tendency still seems to be on geopolitics. Now, I've just taken the Freedom House rankings for this year to give you some sense of the diversity that's out there. Um, and if we just look at the, 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 you might say, the traditional post-Soviet quartet of, of, of um, unrecognized states, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, South Ossetia, and Transnistria, and we add in Northern Cyprus and Somaliland for good measure, we see again how you have, some are partly free, uh, Abkhazia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, that, for example, is, is, is a flattering um, uh, definition for Nagorno-Karabakh when you compare it to its, its so-called parent state, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is not free. Um, so it's, 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 uh, whereas Abkhazia is, is on the same level in that respect with Georgia as, as, as a, a partly free state. Um, sometimes you get the anomaly that Abkhazia, its patron is Russia, which is not free. And yet Abkhazia is partly free. So it's, it's not necessarily determinative that if your patron is, is, is a non-democracy, that the, 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 the proxy or the, 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 the beneficiary of that patronage necessarily has to have the same regime type. And you see something similar perhaps in northern Cyprus, where again, according to the 
Freedom House rankings, which I understand are not sacrosanct, and they have uh, questions raised all the time about their methodology, but uh, Turkey, which is now deemed to be not free, is the patron, whereas uh, Northern Cyprus gets an extremely high mark for its quality of democracy and elections over the years. Uh, and yet, as I said, its major sponsor is a country which has a lot of democratic imperfections. And then look at Somaliland, which has said up until recently nobody recognized, and now only Taiwan recognized. Uh, it's considered to be partly free. The quality of its elections are considered to be rather good. And the state from which it seceded, um, Somalia, is a failed state, a uh, completely failed state, and, 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 and achieves a very low uh, ranking. And if, if you look then throughout the the post-Soviet space generally, you'll see there's no necessary correlation between being recognized and being more or less democratic. Um, you know, partly free, that, that's the best you can get, by the way, in the, in, in, in the, the non-Baltic post-Soviet space. And, uh, you know, two of the uh, six or one third of, of the partly free states are unrecognized ones, Abkhazia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Transnistria and South Ossetia are not free, but they're in good company. And they're not as bad as places like Tajikistan or Turkmenistan. I lived for five years in Central Asia, I have to say. And uh, as someone who's observed elections there and in many of these unrecognized states, you couldn't compare the level of competition um, in, in, for example, Abkhazia or Nagorno-Karabakh to somewhere like uh, Kazakhstan, for example, um, which has been a beneficiary of lots of uh, Western interaction in recent years. And um, yeah, I mean, these are these are tables are just illustrating again the diversity that's there. This one I think highlights more the the ethnic composition. It's very different, uh, for example, between Abkhazia, where the Abkhaz are at best half of the population. I think that's an exaggeration. To rather ethnically homogeneous Nagorno-Karabakh and South Ossetia, to very heterogeneous uh, Transnistria. Different patrons, different currencies, different bases of economy, even different preferences uh, in terms of their ultimate. Uh, goal of where they'd like to be in 10 years. Whereas in South Ossetia, um, integration with Russia is the key goal. In a way, they've been forced into being an unrecognized state. They'd much prefer to be part of the Russian Federation. Uh, opinion is mixed within Transnistria. And in Abkhazia, it's very much in favor of independence. So we can't even say that these are all states with the same kinds of objectives or same uh, even desire to be uh, separate. Um, they have often different geopolitical uh, aims. And, um, and even then, when you look inside these states, um, as I have done over the years, where they're all presidential systems, that doesn't really distinguish of course, them from other post-Soviet states, the, which have, again, a preference for, for presidential types of systems. They tend to go for the second ballot presidential system. But with, after that, you get huge diversity um, from Abkhazia, which use, produces 100% majoritarian single candidate constituencies or single mandate constituencies, uh, where the vast majority of, of MPs are independents, they're not members of political parties, the vast majority of MPs lose their seats at the next election. Uh, it's remarkable, always, in every single Abkhazian parliamentary election, the majority of MPs never keep their seats, and, and they have to defend their seats in a second ballot. It's extraordinarily competitive, uh, despite the fact that it's not even a, pre a parliamentary system. Uh, you've had in Nagorno-Karabakh a progressive moving from uh, a completely majoritarian single mandate constituency-based system to a uh, party list system. Um, it was two thirds uh, constituency, one third party list, then it became the vice versa. And uh, as a, for the last election that was held in March, uh, the end of March in 2020, before the war, all seats were now um, elected by party list. And there, there was a clear strategy there that was to move away from the kind of the personalization of politics and to try and make politics more policy focused. That was at least the, the ostensible objective, whether it was achieved, of course, is another matter uh, entirely. You have a mixed system, a mixture of the two in South Ossetia and in Transnistria, you have 100 uh, percent majoritarian single mandate constituencies again. Uh, but they've reduced their seats from 43 to 33 in the last election in 2020. Very interestingly, and I think this is the key thing here, uh, in the, uh, when you look at the post-Soviet space as a whole, where you have many governments which have been uh, unmovable for decades, and many leaders that have been in power for decades, you've had peaceful transfers of power from government to opposition in these unrecognized states. And sometimes you've had it twice. Um, like in Transnistria, for example, there's, there was a change of government, uh, a, a very competitive election in 2011, where the incumbent came third, um, and, and he, the, his replacement was himself replaced in 2015. And that's generally considered to be a good definition of, of, of uh, I wouldn't say Transnistria, I wouldn't call it a consolidated democracy, there have been a lot of backsliding recently, but at least just there and then when they had that second successive transfer of power between government and opposition, they were getting close to that definition of a consolidated uh, democracy, uh, which is something that you 
would rarely, again, uh, it wouldn't come to mind when you think about these regions automatically. Abkhazia has had two peaceful transfers of power uh, in 2004-2020. Only, only Nagorno-Karabakh actually hasn't had one, and we can discuss that if you want in questions and answers about what made Nagorno-Karabakh somewhat different in that respect. Um, Term limits, they exist except in Transnistria. Gender quotas, interestingly, no except in Nagorno-Karabakh. And it did make a difference in the parliamentary elections most recently. The number of women uh, dramatically increased actually from 15 to uh, to 21% in Nagorno-Karabakh's parliamentary elections uh, in 2020. Um, and again, geopolitical orientation, um, willingness to join the patron state, it's not consistent. Abkhazia wants independence. The others have shown varying degrees of interest in joining the uh, patron, and um, and in terms of their quality of democracy, again, uh, varying widely according to the Freedom House rankings. So to, to conclude, um, the the kind of salient features which I, I, I'd i like, I guess, to bring to your attention is, is that th there's a great diversity there. Um, it, it's a, generally presidential systems, um, but parties are, like in most post-Soviet states, they're, they're not that important. The parliamentarian is more important usually than the party. The ethnic factor, which I could speak about for hours, is crucial. Um, in Abkhazia, you have to be, for example, to be president, you have to be an ethnic Abkhaz and indeed a fluent speaker of Abkhaz. Um, that's because, of course, they're so worried because of their demographic heterogeneity there that an, a non-Abkhaz could take over. That for them would be a... It, it, it would completely negate the whole raison d'etre of creating Abkhazia um, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh and South Ossetia, of course, because of the homogeneity of the population, it's inconceivable that a non-Armenian or non-Ossetian could be elected. And in Transnistria, it's a very different story. But the ethnic factor is always there. Um, and in a way, and in, indeed in Abkhazia, you could, you could really call it an ethnocracy in, in many respects. But in a way, not dissimilar from other post-Soviet states like Kazakhstan, which again had similar demographic problems. 44% of the population of Kazakhstan was Kazakh in 1989 uh, and they took similar measures to kind of Kazakhize society in the way that they're doing as well in, in these nationalizing states as you would call it in the literature. Women in politics, dire, uh, negligible. Um, you don't get uh, women even running for president most of the time. The Nagorno-Karabakh elections of 2020 produced the first female candidates for the president but they, were, they produced a, a derisory vote but still it was significant that they were there. Um, there were a number of firsts by the way in that Karabakh election the first time you had as many as 14 candidates, the first time that you had a second ballot, the, of course, the pandemic complicated matters even further and the first women candidate. So it was a remarkably, remarkably interesting picture that was developing before the war, which is now largely forgotten, of course. Now we're obviously thinking about what the future will be for the policy of Nagorno-Karabakh, but it was developing in a very interesting way before uh, the war uh, took hold. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at the style and the substance of campaigning, um, and that's a, an area that's extraordinarily interesting. Main takeaway is that it's not as different as you would think. People are focused on the same issues in these unrecognized states that they are in recognized states that you're living in and familiar with, salaries, unemployment, quality of roads. It's not as, as, not as exotic as you might think. And that there have been uh, frequently competitive and unpredictable elections involving transfers of power. And, and that, and again, makes it a very interesting phenomenon. And, and uh, I, I was very interested and taken with the notion of the fallacies that was mentioned by Kevork there. There's also a Kosovo fallacy, you might call it, uh, that if you if you kind of have standards uh, of democracy that you have a better chance of getting recognized. This was held by some of these states uh, around 2008, 2009. Uh, that's been quietly, I think, abandoned over the years. Um, but it was a fallacy that was there as well for a while. I, 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 I anticipate there will be some questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and uh, look forward to any questions that people might have. Thank you very much, Donika. Thank you uh, to all the panelists. Before I um, go to the questions, I'm wondering whether you uh, have questions for each other. Um, or should I just go straight to the questions? We should okay. probably go straight to the questions. Great. So uh, our first question is actually uh, for uh, Anna. Uh, it is regarding your uh, mention of uh, your comparison to uh, Armenia's democratic breakthrough to that of Latin America decades earlier. Uh, and the uh, question the question is about uh, scholars such as Stephen Levitsky and Luke and Wei have argued that Latin America's shift away from competitive authoritarianism towards democratization was partially due to linkage and leverage. With regard to the former, the geographical proximity with the U.S. facilitated democratization in the region. 
Scholars who subscribe to Levitsky and Way's thesis contend that Armenia's geographical location and the lack of a white knight may prevent Armenia from sustaining its democratic breakthrough. What is your what is what is your reflection on this thesis? How can Armenia, a country of median linkage and under the geopolitical sphere of Russia, sustain its democratic breakthrough when its geographic location and political, economic, and social exchange with the West US is limited? Uh, that's a very good question, a very, very good question. In general, I do subscribe to uh, uh, many of the dimensions of the linkage leverage theory developed by Levitsky and Way. However, and I have not looked at the Latin American component of the book for a while. However, what is, and this is why I keep talking of the Armenian model, um, what is important in the case of Armenia as a breakthrough in an authoritarian orbit is the importance of grassroots institutions in driving it. The linkage, uh, the linkage um, leverage approach, for those of you who are not in the field, essentially it's a theory that argues those countries that have significant relationships with Western states are more likely to have democratic transitions and consolidate them. In the case of Latin America, the argument goes, that is the Western influence that helped. Uh, but I think in the case of uh, Latin American trans transition, I'd say that Democ the countries in Latin America democratized <laughs> despite uh, American support of authoritarian systems such as Chile. So it's interesting to look at uh, uh, during the Cold War, US's influence of its uh, some of its allies has been in support of authoritarianism, largely as a reaction to contain them relative the essentially looking at it through the communist lens. Now, going back to the Armenia's breakthrough in uh, uh, authoritarian orbit, and it's important to look at Armenia and Belarus as well. I think we are entering a period that we need to really disabuse ourselves of this Russia-centric perspective. There's a lot of uh, many voices would say, and actually the West also uh, did not capitalize on the systemic impact of Armenia's Velvet Revolution in South Caucasus, largely looking at it from the from the uh, Western geopoliticized frame. It can't be real because it's not uh, it's not ushered and godfathered by the West. So I think there is a bias there that is scholarly. That there's more and more evidence that is emerging that is really contradicting this. Uh, in in terms of, uh, and uh, in the book, there is a chapter on diaspora, a very good chapter by Christine Kavukian, and I encourage you to read that. Um, but uh, what I would say in this particular case, diaspora, I think, is not sufficiently theorized by Levitsky and Way, uh, because diaspora was a wild card, whether diaspora wanted it or not, by contributing in terms of socioeconomic initiatives in Armenia, they helped the society not to be co-opted by the government, not that the government was eager to co-opt the civil society through social economic projects, which you saw happening in some of the Middle Eastern countries where uh, Arab Spring has happened. But still, I think diaspora's socioeconomic impact, uh, while we can debate as to uh, what it did to institutional, but I think it helped the civil society to develop separate from the state. And that is under theory theorized in the case of Armenia. But again, it's just a, uh, I would, I hope there would be more research on that. Um, so I would say that looking forward, we need to again, moving away from this Kremlin centric view. It's important to understand that both Belarus and Armenia, there's something afoot that dem democratic breakthroughs are happening through grassroots institutions, and they have enjoyed significant some stability uh, by not attacking the statehood. But I think understanding as to why this new democracies might be in Russia's interest, well, they definitely do provide uh, easier intrusion by Russia playing one side or the other. And these uh, vulnerabilities are definitely there. Uh, but at the same time, I think, um, uh, strong Russia does realize that this is a new generation of state building that is happening. And again, uh, uh, I agree with Kevor's comments on the Azerbaijan, but I do think that the research that this is democracy, I do think it's important as to what happens to Georgia uh, in terms of in strengthening the impact. I do argue that uh, 
Azerbaijan really, because the pressures were so high, you could hear Aliyev saying, oh, we were so patient. We were patient for 30 years for Armenia to make concessions. But when you calculate, Aliyev was patient with Serge Sarkisian regime for how many years, right? But with the democratic system, it was patient, or the patients ran out for two years, in two years, basically. The argument being that I think Aliyev was under pressure, that democracy was strengthening, and that played a, against the backdrop of Belarus. And he did face, essentially, he was a strategic move in pulling in Turkey in such a times of COVID in such a spectacular way. Uh, so, just to conclude, Nurses and I are working on a paper that is under review right now. The title is How to Tame Your Dragons. Essentially, it's an approach to understand how democratic states, uh, democratic breakthroughs happen in a Russia's authoritarian orbit. Uh, and if you look, and I, I can't wait to read Kevork's book, um, if you look at Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, a uh, lot of developments happen in the peripheries, and very often Russia is very much behind, a step behind as to what's happening in the peripheries. Right. Would uh, anyone else like to address that question? Um, yes. No. More just what Anna said, I, I completely agree about the, the Russian-centric approach. I mean, for you know, Russia doesn't actually care so much about whether there is a more democratic form of governance in Transnistria or Abkhazia, as long as the candidates are pro-Russia. If all of the candidates are pro-Russian and they're democratically elected, Russia's absolutely fine with that. And it, they've had their own candidates, their Kremlin favorites, defeated democratically in elections, and they've completely lived with the outcomes because they know that the the opposition candidate was pro-Russia as well. So it's it's kind of a fallacy that the, the Kremlin is handpicking or, or, or orchestrating. Actually, usually it's far too peripheral from the Kremlin's major concerns to be to be orchestrating because they know that uh, all the candidates, as I said, are more or less supportive of the of, of the main Russian pro-Russia policies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, the, our next question is actually for uh, Nerses. I'm going to um, just go to the question part instead of reading the whole thing as I did with the previous one. Uh, does Pashinyan risk losing his support network or political capital if he continues his rhetoric with inaction? Is voter alien alienation of my step partisans inevitable? if accountability for previous regime actions is limited to Pashinyan's campaign style rhetoric? That's an interesting question. Um, Pashinyan's rhetoric has sort of been a, a substitute for reforms. And I think when he starts engaging in sort of this uh, aggressive discourse, which is actually intended to suffice to, to satisfy his base, primarily made up of you know, rural peasantry and urban middle class and lower middle classes, um, the whole discourse is about reforms or demand for accountability. But because, as we know, reforms are extraordinarily difficult things to implement and they're time-consuming, and not, uh, not even to consider the, the, the sort of the diverse uh, institutional uh, components that sort of uh, obstruct or slow down the process, uh, nascent democracies need time to have institutional reforms. What Pashin is trying to do is trying to leverage the time-consuming process of reforms while at the same time appeasing his base who actually wants uh, accountability or punishment for the previous regime. So this has been sort of a double-edged sword. I think it works with the base because uh, to a very large extent, there's so, so much of visceral hatred and anger and resentment towards the previous regime that any rhetoric that demonizes the previous regime works. But that in of itself is not a substitute for constructive and substantive reforms. And so this could only last for so long. But that is an institutional and in a technical argument we're making. Uh, the, the question is, would this alienate his base? It would not. Uh, as long as the rhetoric is sustainable and there's some action, the base appears to be satisfied. Also, important to consider is that there had been, uh, there has been some action or excessive action on, on uh, battling corruption or are dealing with some kind of a reforms with the police force. That's why the ratings for the police have become so, so thing, uh, uh, higher uh, relations that have passed. Um, there have been, um, there's been the broader economic thing, competition and sort of a level playing field. So we have seen some systemic reforms which have appeased uh, the whole discourse on, is there action with respect to thing, uh, all the talk that's going on, there has been some action. But to the extent to which we qualify as satisfactory or not, that obviously uh, is to be seen. But the biggest issue that the government faces right now is institutional reforms with respect to the judiciary. And this has been a broad discussion for some time. 
And if we've seen Pashinyan's rhetoric in the last two years, a lot of this anger and aggression has been against the judiciary. Judicial reforms are extraordinarily difficult. You know, Latin America was brought up in the conversation. It took Latin America almost a decade to do these reforms. Uh, Eastern Europe struggled for quite a bit uh, in implementing its social reforms. You still have concerns in part of parts of Eastern Europe uh, as far as these reforms are concerned. And so because of the, the time-consuming aspect, uh, the Pashinyan government has been very frustrated. Of course, they're also at fault for not implementing some of the uh, programs of transitional justice that have been presented. But fundamentally, a lot of the angry rhetoric has been towards the judiciary, and this resonates with the base because the base views the courts as being the protectors of the previous regime or the protectors of the authority and reserves. And so the fact that the courts have been institutionally uh, insulated from accountability uh, has kind of fit into this rhetoric. And so this is a multi-tiered question, but to kind of uh, simplify it, uh, there has been some action which has been satisfactory to the base. Uh, his supporters want more. Uh, that more is difficult. And so when that more cannot be provided, that is, he fills that up, fills it in with more aggressive rhetoric. And uh, the, the whole question of, you know, uh, what did he mean when he said, you know, that the, this is the end of velvet or we're dropping a gauntlet and so on and so forth. Uh, that's basically an indication that the full uh, uh, strength of the law is going to be utilized to push through more aggressive reforms. Uh, several laws have been passed on this. The, the constitutional courts are being developed. Um, laws on the disparity in wealth, uh, where there's, if there's a disparity between one's income and one's wealth, uh, would require accountability. So there are things in the works. Um, but uh, the, the speed of these developments is the issue. And so to basically to... Uh, account for the uh, slow pace of developments, Pashinyan does what he excels at, and that is engaging in sort of this bombastic rhetoric. But I don't think it leads to alienation. I think it has a reverse effect. I think it really works very well with this base. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? Uh, I know that we, our panel is supposed to go to 1130, but uh, we do, would you mind taking a couple of other questions? Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a question for Kebork uh, regarding your list of fallacies. Can we add that Armenia in the post-first Larapa war from 1990s onwards reflected a status quo fallacy in believing that the status quo of the territories would endure? Yes, of course, and uh, you know, I, I would very much agree with that. And you would have to ask yourself, where does that come from? Um, it came from, from unwillingness, I believe, for, by Kocharyan and Sarkisan in particular, to invest uh, political and social capital in challenging a kind of discourse about Artsakh that had emerged in the 2000s and the 20, 2010s. And I believe that you can't really separate that from the kind of, the kind of switch in the, in the nationalisms that were advocated by Levante Petrosian in the, in the 1990s and the kind of nationalism that Kocharyan and, and Sarkisian were, were more adhering to. You know, Kocharyan and Sarkisian had a more pan-Armenian view of nationalism or a more ethno-nationalist, whereas, of course, Ter Petrosian had a much more civic, um, civic form of nationalism, Armenia as a state, much more state-centric. And once you move towards the ethnic, the ethno, the ethnic interpretation of nationalism as pan-Armenian, um, and you could see that in Armenian, in Armenian discourses about Artsakh. If you go back to the 1990s, if you, if, when you looked at maps of Artsakh, they were basically the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomous region with Shahumyan added on. And over the 2000s, you, you saw the addition of the, of, the, of the territories around that. And of course, that has to do with the kind of discourse that emerged in conjunction with that ethno-nationalism, the idea that this was not just about the human rights, the civic rights, the civil rights of the Armenians who lived there, which is an argument that you can make to a much greater degree if you adhere to civic nationalism, but also about inalienable territories that belong, that are you know, an inseparable part of Armenia and the Armenian nation. And so in, in a way, the status quo fallacy was a rationalization that, you know, that allowed for that, you know, for that lack of social and uh, political capital being invested in challenging these, uh, these notions that were ultimately, that ultimately stood in the way of, uh, of Possible, com uh, a, a possible compromise in the land for uh, in the land land for peace fallacy. So you know you, you heard things like um, I, uh, probably the calculation was at some point in, in a kind of 
in the long run, we're all dead kind of way. Nagorno-Karabakh might be recognized in, in its current form, that kind of rationalization that might have driven some of the, you know, some of the strategies behind uh, Armenia's uh, approach to Artsakh. Um, and also you know, the kind of rationalization that you saw and was very quite, quite persistent, you know, the kind of the rationalization that topography will save us. Um, the lack of criticism of, uh, the lack of critical attitude towards the army as well, that also, I believe, weakened the army, the army, the army in the position and ultimately, uh, you know, led to the kind of complacency that I think is expressed in the status quo. The number of times that I would go to Armenia and people would tell me, oh, the Artsakh issue has been resolved. That's it. Uh, and you know, that was indeed a fallacy, status, the status quo fallacy. So you can add that that to the, uh, to the list. So in the, in, and all of that in light of a very clearly ever um, divergent balance of power between Armenia and, 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 uh, and Azerbaijan that in that way essentially was rationalized away. And we have, Armenia really has to think about uh, but how that happened and avoid that going forward. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, the next question um, is for everyone, but probably Donaka, uh, you should probably take it first. Uh, historical comparisons are often problematic, uh, but how inaccurate would it be to see Armenia today as Czechoslovakia in 1938, a tiny democracy sacrificed in the altar of realpolitik? I don't know, I'm thinking in terms of comparisons and global context. That's why I thought of you first. <laughs> yeah, um, well, Czechoslovakia in 1938, that, that's, that's a very ominous parallel, obviously. Um, and I think that it's, it's not as predetermined as that, that annexation seems. I mean, but certainly, I, I, what, I, what surprised me, I'll, I'll say as, as somebody living here in Ireland in Western Europe, what really surprised me as a frequent visitor to, to Armenia, to Karabakh, indeed to Azerbaijan, was how little traction there was in the media and in the popular coverage um, about the war. I mean, you, I, I, I didn't really realize how peripheral and exotic and distant uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan seems to people in Western Europe until the war actually broke out. When you thought that thousands of people died in such a short space of time, and yet we were just get on a diet of, you know, I mean, COVID is important, but these were just variations of the same story over and over again, where I think three people were killed in Vienna. There was a terrorist attack uh, around that time. And mm -hmm. again, there was blanket coverage because, of course, everybody's been to Vienna, knows somebody in Vienna, uh, would like to go to Vienna. But you, you realize that that didn't apply to Yerevan. It didn't apply to Stepan Kurt. There was no kind of human even uh, interest in, in, you know, the appalling atrocities that were taking place. So I think if the questioner is arguing, I mean, there's that famous statement from Chamberlain about, you know, why, why should we involve ourselves in this distant country about which we know nothing? And that was why Czechoslovakia was sacrificed by the British Foreign Office at the time, and indeed the, the West. You could argue, yes, that a similar lack of empathy and distance uh, was certainly uh, demonstrated towards Armenians during this this conflict, this recent conflict. And and as I said, I was I was really surprised and appalled because I always thought that if the war did break out, and of course there was that notion that it was a very, I mean, this was a war that was going to happen. All, all the ingredients were there that, that there would be a huge, at least public interest. It would draw in so many different elements to the mix. But it, it it was it was not like that at all, and and uh, that to me, you know, was was shocking, really, and surprising. Thank you. Anyone else like to comment? I would love to jump in just to. I agree. I think the question was from Avedi Sajjan. I agree that we have to be careful with historical comparisons, but um, and I the question I would have is the the nature of Czechoslovakia's uh, democracy. I think um, at the time, um, number one, the Armenia's velvet, the, uh, the velvet signature that I always kind of hammer on it, I realize incessantly, is that it was so bottom up. It was so grassroots. So the people power is gaining enormous uh, traction in the scholarly research as a political strategy of campaigning and making political change. So I don't know enough about the nature, the depth, 
of democracy in Czechoslovakia in 1930s. Uh, but the world, I, I agree that we need to be worried. I mean, geopolitical stressors are definitely there. It's not an environment hospitable to democratization. But at the same time, the world with accounting the democratic declines still has a lot more democracies than it had in 1930s. Even authoritarian states are playing with democratic rules, at least trying to legitimize their power through democratic rules. Um, and people are a lot more mobilized, regardless of real politic. The protest activity around the world that is at very high levels. So I would say that Armenia has significant agency and uh, people power is the key that will keep this stick. And it's important also not to come, sometimes I'll hear populism. Populism is very different from people power. Maybe we could do another panel on this, but it's just a little footnote, I'm <laughs> digressing. Uh, but yeah, just my two cents on that question. Anyone else? Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I think uh, our audience uh, and I learned a great deal uh, that uh, we didn't know. Um, any last words on the subject? Yes. Just I'll, I'll say this because there is an air of pessimism I, I can feel <laughs> falling now <laughs> after that, that question and the comparisons with Czechoslovakia. But again, maybe I'll just emphasize here in Ireland that for for decades, for generations even, you know, the so-called Irish question, you know, was the one that was a political graveyard for, for many politicians and, and it was seen to be insolvable. And there has been huge breakthroughs made in recent times, a transformation which was unforeseeable and that... I, I'm old enough to remember how dark it was in the in the late 80s and early 90s, just before the dawns of the the ceasefires, the agreements, the power sharing arrangements, which were guaranteed by the two sovereign governments in London and Dublin, and indeed the international community. So, it's it's it, it's it's not inevitable uh, that things will get worse. Um, it it does take political ingenuity. It does take leadership. It does take democracy. And this is where Anna's contribution is so important. That I mean, one of the key aspects about the uh, peace process here is that it was guaranteed by two sovereign governments which were democratic uh, the united kingdom government and the dublin government the irish government which even though they had different political views on the future of northern ireland even though they had you might say ethnic kin who were who were at each other's throats within northern ireland it wasn't they, because they were democratic there were those uh, larger picture prerogatives that brought them to a peace process or at least convinced them that it was it was better than the alternatives a mutually hurting stalemate brought them there so that's a long way of saying that it's it's um it is possible to to break the logjam to to get out of the cycles that seem to be you know perpetual uh and 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 uh but it, it does take time and it does take uh patience and it does take ingenuity i think that's a wonderful way to end it thank you i appreciate that <laughs> Okay, uh, wonderful. Uh, I uh, thank you again uh, uh, for sharing your expertise with us, all of you, and for the uh, uh, audience for joining us. And we hope you join us again uh, in April for our next webinar on the Turkish on the Armenian community uh, in Turkey uh, on April twenty uh, third. Uh, thank you again. Uh, this has been recorded, and uh, we it will go uh, on our YouTube channel uh, for the Center for Armenian Studies. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and have a good rest of the day or uh, night, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.